Welcome back to uh, First Start and, um, and to the second part of EA Sustain's fantastic festival. Uh, we started with a bang with Caroline Lucas, which is a, a, a wonderful way to get an overview of the issues of green politics, but also raised for us, in a sense, or, or was, a, was a great prelude to this, what has become a centrally important political issue, apparently rising up the agenda in many elections and likely to be a significant uh, part of the next election, uh, which is water quality and the quality of water. We've all had Fergal Sharkey speaking with fantastic eloquence on our TVs for the last few months, if not years, about the issues of what's happening to our rivers. And today we've got an event that tackles that, Murky Waters. And we couldn't have had two better speakers than um, the gentleman on my right. Um, Neil, Neil Ward, whose book is uh, uh, on the shelf. Sorry, what's it called again, Neil? Net Zero Food Net, and Farming. F Net Zero Food and Farming is a fantastic book and is on sale at the bookshop. Neil is a professor at the School of Environmental Sciences at the University of East Anglia. He was previously UEA's Deputy Vice Chancellor from 14 to 21 and Director of Newcastle University's Centre for Rural Economy. He is the author of Net Zero and, the, and, and also is a co-convener of the UK's Research Council's new network on agri-food for Net Zero. He served as a Cabinet Office Advisor on Agricultural Policy and has appeared before numerous parliamentary select committees, including Caroline Lucas. No. Oh. <laughs> uh, Charles Watson on the far right is the founder and chair of River Action, a UK-based environmental charity committed to addressing the severe problems of river pollution, especially from agriculture and food industry practices. Charles is also, and this is important uh, for this issue of connectivity, a business leader who held senior leadership positions, including CEO of Financial Dynamics, a chairman of Karma Communications Group, a, 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 a PR consultancy, was it, Charles? Yeah. And chairman of Tenio International. And in June 2020, he exited the commercial sector to focus primarily on environmental conservation. So he is the classic poacher turned gamekeeper. <laughs> and there couldn't be anyone better to understand the issues from both sides. So first, we'll kick off, Charles, with uh, we all hear a lot about water and the issues of pollution. And we've all come to imagine it as those human turds floating down our rivers towards wild swimmers. But really, we could do with a bit of biochemical clarity on what, what actually is pollution. You know, what is it, where does it come from, what are its key sources? Well, well as you say, the, the celebrity po polluter is human sewage. And we all, I think we know about that. I mean, we're reading about it on a, you know, we know that our, our water industry was privatised. Um, it was put into, into private equity style ownership. It was laden with debt. It was sort of raped and pillaged with dividend payments. And now we're paying the price for it. So, uh, and, and that is a very simple thing. But, but, but this, the celebrity polluter of sewage probably only accounts for about 40% of what is happening to our rivers. And what we must remember is not one single river in, in this country is, 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 is in good biological and chemical condition. Yeah. So every river is polluted. And the rivers just down here, if you go down to the, you know, the wonderful coastal estuaries of, of you know, Suffolk and Essex, um, what is coming down those rivers is, is appalling. And, and most of what is coming down those rivers is actually from agriculture and from intensive agriculture. Now, some of the things we don't even know about, um, 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 forever chemicals, um, insecticides, I mean, nobody is even properly monitoring those. But the thing we do know about is nutrients. And right. so, so, so to grow crops, as we all know, you have to fertilize them. You have to, um, a crop cannot grow without nitrogen, it cannot grow without phosphorus or, or, or potassium. But the problem is, as agriculture has in, is, is progressively intensified, and the reason it's intensified is, is, is the procurement of, of food is effectively now controlled in this country by about four or five you know, big supermarket groups. Um, a farmer, the, the number of options for, for a farmer to sell their, their who, to whom to sell their produce to has just gone from you know, dozens to, to probably one or two in their, in their, where, the, where, the, where they're based. Um, 
And, and that has meant that prices have been squeezed and what, what a farmer gets paid gets completely compressed, which means agric agriculture has to intensify. And so if we take dairy, um, um, you know, da da dairy farming, the majority of dairy farming in this country and around the world is intensive. These are huge herds of cows that are kept indoors. They're stuffed full of feed. Um, the excrement that comes out of them is, is, is mismanaged and it ends up going into the soils. Now, it either washes directly into rivers um, when it rains and, and, and climate change is a huge cause of pollution because, as we know, we, we are on... Um, in this storm season this year, we are on the eighth named storm. Um, we've just had H. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And normally, we, we might not even got to the first one by this time of the year. Yeah. So, so, so huge volumes of, 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 of water is washing this stuff through. But, but, but the worst of all, I think, of, of, and, and Neil had much to say about this, but the, the worst of all is diffuse pollution. So the soils of the land are just being doused year on year on year with, with these chemical fertilizers in ever-increasing quantities. Um, and then a lot of those fertilizers go into animals through the feed, because most of what we grow as crops, ironically, is to, is to feed animals. It goes into the front end of an animal, it comes out the back end of the animal, and then it gets spread across the land. And then that washes and permeates into the soils as well. So, so many of the river catchments of, the, of, of, these, of, of our country are like giant contamination zones. So, 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 um, so human waste or, or, or sewage from... from from human communities is accounting for 40%. What is agriculture accounting for? Is it equal to...? It's a bit more. I mean, according to the Environment Agency, if you trust what the Environment Agency say, um, that's a question, but... Neil, do yeah. you have yeah. figures? Well, ag ag agriculture is the most extensive the, cause of the biggest cause. river quality. Yeah. Yes, but... All... Uh, and then, then comes sewage pollution. OK, but even roads are a source. Yeah, I think that comes third, sort third. of washing off okay. from highways. So there are three key sources of pollution. Um, and and this is now as w as we have in the uh, in the media at the moment. You know, we become the dirty man of Europe. But this is for it's interesting. It's a man. Well, I, sh I think it should be a man probably. Um, <laughs> but 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 this isn't the beginning of our status as the dirty man of Europe. Neil, could you take us through back to the 1980s or even the 70s and the Thatcher government and the ways in which. Uh, this country has attempted to tackle the problems of water pollution. Yeah, there's a strange sort of sense of history repeating itself a, a bit. And um, for, for me personally, uh, this is it, it, it's quite cyclical because I did start my academic career working for about six or seven years on, uh, on water quality issues, particularly agricultural pollution, 1989 through to the mid-90s. And then I moved away for about 25 years and looked at other things and I've just been sort of revisiting it over the last couple of years. That, that period in the, in the 80s, um, it was interesting for a couple of reasons. There'd been deindustrialization, so a lot of the sort of heavy chemical pollution coming out of factories into rivers was disappearing as factories closed and heavy industries closed down. Um, and we had the increasing influence of European environmental directives which required that uh, water authorities, as they then were, monitored and, uh, and reported on data. So there's more data available. And in the 1980s, gradually, it became recognised that agriculture was uh, more significant as a cause of, of water quality problems than had previously been, previously been assumed. Uh, and uh, fertilisers, pesticides in drinking water was a big controversy, which came to light because of the drinking water directive requirements to monitor and report. Uh, but I think the biggest and thorniest problem is around livestock and, and particularly dairy farming. Uh, and, and, and has that as, occurred? As we, did, we, did we sort of climb in our ability to deal with water pollution? Because yeah. the NRA was originally, the Nat National Rivers yeah. Authority was originally effective in dealing with aspects of pollution. Did we cease yeah. to be the dirty man of Europe? Well, there was a peak of sort of regulatory activity and, and a sort of big a big sort of surge to try and fix the problem around the time of privatisation. So that okay. privatisation was quite a controversial one. It was probably okay. the most controversial of the Thatcher privatisation. When, when mm. was privatisation, just out of interest? It just was in the about 1990, 91 89 was the law. Sort of, that's when yeah, it started. Yeah. Then they started trading on the stock market. Yeah. So, so we've got a new regulatory yeah. body in the National Rivers Authority, which eventually becomes the Environment Agency. We have the privatisation of water. What happens with that event? 
Well, the problem was the regional water authorities pr provided drinking water, dealt with sewage, but they were also responsible for pollution regulation. So they were poachers and gamekeepers in the same uh, organisation. And you couldn't just privatise that function. So the National Rivers Authority was established by Nicholas Ridley, who was quite a sort of um, free market, you know, Thatcherite politician. You can speak politician. Over, he's not here. Yeah, no, he's not anymore. <laughs> Um, he was the minister against the environment, wasn't he? Uh, but he did establish a strong national regulatory body. It became the Environment Agency in, in 1996. Uh, but there were a set of sticks and carrots. So the sticks were fines went up from £2,000 to £20,000 for causing pollution. Uh, there were much more strict regulations around slurry storage facilities and dirty water pumps. You had to have much better kit. Uh, and there were grants to help subsidise the purchase of pollution equipment and um, an intensive advisory campaign. So you had a, a framework which had lots of different strands to it and lots of farmers invested. Uh, and the technical standards said your, your slurry store's got to be good for 20 years. That was the law. Um, of course, this is all 30 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So um, lots of farmers did invest in all of that stuff, but it's, yeah. it's getting quite aged now. Yeah. Uh, but there, were, there was a big push uh, at the time of privatisation to, to grapple with farm pollution. But what it did was it reduced the number of incidents, serious spillages, where there was a, uh, an acute point source problem. But you still, still had to distribute the stuff somewhere, and it went onto the land, and it didn't actually deal with the fundamental unsustainability of the underlying production system, which is too many cows concentrated in certain places. Yeah, we'll come on to that. I mean, do, do we have a period when our water quality was higher? In other words, was EU regulation, these, these broader continental scale regulations? Oh, well, so so the, the EU regulatory regime um, is robust. I mean, robust, I mean the, yeah. the, the, the Green New Deal, um, which, um, and, and it's caused huge controversy. I mean, today, the whole of Germany is at a standstill because all the farmers have blocked every road. Um, because um, they hate uh, it. And, and in Holland, um, uh, you know, a material se segment of dairy production has been shut down in order to make these, make, meet, meet these, these um, standards to, to, to reduce the application of these fertilisers. So, yes. so it, 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 comes, it, comes, it comes with the price. It comes with the price. But, but I think, going back to this country, that I think the, the real next blow to happen after the privatisation of the water industry was austerity. I was going to come on so, to austerity. So in order, to, that, pay, in order to pay for the fact that a bunch of bankers you know, bankrupted the country, we chose in this country, to, to, the government at the time chose in this country to pay for that by cutting back on public services. And yeah. if there was one public service that was cut back more than anything, it was environmental protection. So yes. the Environment Agency, the Environment Agency mm -hmm. in England and its equivalents in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, um, the EA's enforcement budget, environmental protection budget, was cut by 75% in the 10 years following the beginning of austerity. So go back to 2012, before, mm -hmm. be when, before this began, um, there were 200, and I think it's 275 individual enforcements against polluters, prosecutions against polluters. Now, two years ago, there were two. There were two. Um, and so basically, um, whilst there are regulations, and we have inherited a robust set of environmental regulations, which are now being sort of un unpicked, but we inherited a robust set of environmental reg regulations from the EU, we removed the means to enforce them. Yes. Which means that if you're a water company, it is actually, it, it's actually cheaper just to pay the fine yes. rather than fix the system. Yes. Um, and if you take agriculture, and you know, I think we all have to be you know, sympathetic to the challenges farmers face. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it is a mm -hmm. tough... Thing to be in particular, as I said, you're being constantly, you know, put oh, upon by yeah. procurement from Tesco and Sainsbury's to sort mm -hmm. of, you know, cheaper and cheaper mm -hmm. food. But it, the far, Michael Gove, when he was Environment Minister, introduced in 2018 a set of regulations called the Farming Rules for Water. These are totally fit for purpose. They separate agriculture and and um, and water and rivers. They, they there are strict rules within this that says you shall not overload soils with excessive nutrients if, if it can't be naturally absorbed. The only problem is, he didn't have his, well, his successor, who the following year sacked virtually every farm inspector. So who year. was the successor? Her name was Liz Truss. Liz Truss. <laughs> um, um, and and yeah. she got, and it's in Hansard, you can read it. She, she, she stood up in Parliament and proudly said, we're going to free the farmers, um, liberate them from red tape, regulatory red tape. And in doing so, 
removed law enforcement. So, I mean, one of the interesting things is everybody cares at one level about being able to swim or to fish or to experience rivers free of pollution. Are we saying that in the period of austerity we were actually served or ruled by a group of politicians for whom these issues mattered not at all? Is that what we're saying? Did they not care about these issues? Can we name the people who have led to the decline of our water quality? Or is it uh, also to do with the privatisation of the water companies and the water companies were not taking account of one aspect of that pollution, which is I sewage? Think, I think it's all of those. It's all of those. It's all of, yeah. all of those. I mean, yeah. you had, a, you had a, a water industry that was suddenly driven by profit and returning money to shareholders, not investing in the system. Right. You had regulators that were <coughs> systematically defunded so we didn't have to put up income tax. Um, we had the climate putting ever more stress on the system. We have agriculture that's under ever more... Or, more precious to intensify and use more polluting sort of methods. And all of these have just converged in one place. Yeah. And that is why we, every river in this country is now polluted. Neil, I mean, take us through, I mean, we all despise the idea of, of, of human effluent flowing down our rivers. That seems to be, us to be a kind of cringe-worthy moment. But what, what are its impacts on nature? What are we seeing as a result of our deregulation, our lack of proper enforcement and the intensifying nature of our pollution. So what is, what is being affected by these factors? Uh, well, the sewage pollution and the agricultural pollution from, from livestock farms is pretty similar, actually. It's, uh, it, it sucks the oxygen out of the river. Sucks oxygen. Yeah, yeah, if you think Through about it. over-nutrifying it. Uh, yeah, and the, there are the biological process that happens in the water when the, the dung... Uh, is going in, it, it, it just... It, Eutrophies it. It, 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 take, it sucks oxygen out, yes, so, yeah. um, so the fish don't thrive and the whole ecosystem gets completely, completely messed up. Uh, the, the agricultural slurries uh, are actually even more polluting than the untreated human sewage. So I was quite struck when doing this research in the 80s, uh, an average dairy farm at that time produced the same pollution potential uh, of a, a, a human settlement of about 10 or 11,000 people. Mm -hmm. uh, this was in the, in the mid-1980s. The average dairy herd was 21 cows in 1961. It was um, 60 cows in 1991. Uh, it's now 140, 150 cows for, on average for a dairy herd. So an average dairy herd now has the pollution potential of a town of about 30,000 people. Yes. And walk us, just walk us through what are the effects of of essentially taking oxygen out of the water in the river. What, 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 what impacts are we seeing? Are we seeing fewer fish? What animals or what organisms, are presumably beginning with, with the, the uh, phytoplankton and, and plants? It wipes out basically the ecosystem. So, so um, it creates a process called eutrophication, which yes. is um, um, more commonly known as an algal bloom. Okay. Um, the whole of the river will go, or, or the water body, whether it's a lake or a river, will go into a complete opaque, yeah. green, grey, whatever it might be, yeah. um, and everything underneath it dies. Yes. And so, and 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 the, probably the most v most sort of vivid places to witness this is when it what it does to marine environments. So, yeah. so sitting in the Gulf of Mexico mm -hmm. is the dead zone of the Mississippi. So yeah. all those agricultural nutrients are washing down the Mississippi. Uh, and there is an area that sometimes, some, some years, is the size of the state of Massachusetts, mm -hmm. of dead. Yeah. And nothing underneath it lives. In the yeah. Baltic, yeah. there are several dead zones that appear yes. in the summer. And this is yeah. a result of everything coming down the big Eastern European rivers, like the Vistula. Um, yes. um, I mean, it, that last summer in Plymouth Sound, there was a, a eutrophication event where there was an algal bloom in one of our estuaries here in, the, in, in this country. So it, 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 it kills everything underneath it. Yes. It's as simple as that. It, it is yeah. the death star. Yes. Of, um, yeah. so, so essentially, we also should say that it's wrong to see rivers as isolated in themselves because, of course, they are part of the larger aquatic environment. Those, pro those problems that are in marine environments in the Gulf of Mexico and off the Baltic are, are delivered by human sources and agricultural sources on land through rivers. Rivers are the vectors of these dead zones where almost all life is dying in increasing numbers. I think there are about 70 now recognized dead zones across the marine environment of our planet. So what we have to see is that the issues 
We can't isolate it, can we? River is one of those, water is one of those things where we have to see that they flow through the whole entire parameters of the living system of the biosphere. Our um, problem with bathing waters I mean, is popularly understood as sewage discharges to sea, which is a big problem. Uh, but actually what runs off, is washed off the land and into the rivers impacts on the quality of, of bathing waters. So, you know, beaches not getting the blue flag and that sort of thing. Uh, Do we run, see it run off from to... land is, yes. a, is, a, mm. is a contributory uh, factor in, um, in poor those. bathing water quality around the coast. And that's how we've come to understand it. But really, we should see it at an ecosystem or biome level or the biosphere, really. It's mm. the entire... Uh, water system. So we have an election coming up. We had Caroline here talking about the future of the Green Party, hopefully in the next election. Um, uh, oh, I leaked my political views there. Uh, <laughs> we have an election coming up. This is really for both of you. What should happen? What will happen? Is there a difference? What, what, what do we want to see come about, both of you, I suppose. I'll, I'll take Charles first, perhaps. Uh, okay, well, look, there's, there are longer-term things that have to happen in terms of the way we consume food and in terms of the way we manage the land. But in terms of the election, that is in a few months' time. So this is the shorter-term things. We, we have an incredibly simple ask. You go to the River Action website, you'll see it there. It's our charter for rivers. We have you know, su summarised this into, into some very simple answers. But the most important of all is we need our regulators refunded and we need re law enforcement empowered again um, because we have the regulations we have the rules we have the laws they are deliberately and this is not a conspiracy theory this is a reality i'm in court in four weeks time in, a high, in the high court i'm suing the government i'm suing the environment agency in defra for for systematically and deliberately and consciously not enforcing some of these critical regulations that had they been enforced we would have seen some of the, a large amount of these problems being solved. So that is, and, and, and when I, I, mean, I was meeting with the Labour front bench um, shadow environment team the other day, and they asked me what it would cost, and I told them what it would cost is 100 metres of what has been spent on HS2. That is what it would cost. All our rivers, all our rivers, 100 metres of... To, to refund the Environment Agency, to put back in place the... Info, the, the is that enough? Is it, um, is it enough no, just to restore it no, to what that, it was? No, I mean, that's all that's needed. I mean, you, to, to, to have proper monitoring of water quality, to have proper inspection of polluters, and to have proper enforcement of rules, that is what would be needed. It's about 12 million quid to, to refund yeah. law enforcement, yes. and that would make a huge difference thing in the short term but there are bigger longer term issues <laughs> so I, I i agree i think that's num that's the number one sort of yeah. quick win really uh, we've got the laws um have to uh, make sure you have the capacity to enforce them properly two things i would add though uh, i mean i think there is scope for government to tackle the economic regulation of the water companies uh, the bosses are getting quite decent bonuses and things like that so there's some things that could be done to incentivize water companies to comply a lot more on the on the sewage discharge side but thirdly uh, I think the net zero challenge and the climate change, uh, I, I think getting to grips with that and what it means for land and food and farming will help with water quality. Uh, we, we've got a problem with the livestock sector emitting methane and that, to get to net zero we're going to have to bring that down. Uh, and so I think we can think about climate change, greenhouse gas emissions and water quality risks around the livestock sector hand in hand and think about how we organise our farming in a way that reduces water pollution risks and greenhouse gas emissions together. So, so Charles is saying the quick fix is a reinstatement. What about beefing up our regulatory system so we actually invest more because we realise how important... Will that happen or all, is all you're, all you're calling for or is all that's likely to happen just a reinstatement of the status anti... Uh, austerity, or do we need more than that? Um, That's it, it, good it's enough. not going to break the bank. It's no. not going to break the bank. I mean, fixing fixing the yeah. our sewage system, which yeah. require you know, it's, we're talking about hundreds of millions, hundreds of millions of pounds was stripped out in dividends yes. and, and and imposed as debt on an industry. <laughs> it's nice to hear you saying this. Um, having worked on the privatisation <laughs> of the water industry many many years ago, um, uh, uh, and and that is that has failed. I mean, that, yeah. that and, and yeah. there is no other country in Western Europe yeah. that has had its sewage and provision of. And remember, it's not just it's also provision of what we drink yeah. as well as taking away you know yes. what we excrete. Yeah. Um, there is no other country in Western Europe that has put that into allow that to fall into like private equity 
type ownership. I mean, yes. it's, it's, it is... Are, are you saying that water shouldn't be a matter of business? It's an essential service. It's um, an essential service. It's an, Should it have been retained as a kind of component? It should never have been privatised. Like I'm, the post office, yeah. which runs so well. As <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think, I think you know, trying to put it, turn the clock back is now problematic. I mean, yes, I mean yes, because the yes, problem yes. is if you... Re, re, I don't think reprivatization is no. would create more problems than it. Yeah. But but um, but it, but there has to be a huge catch up in okay. investment okay. Um, in our water industry. But but to fix regulation, it, it's 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 just about hiring hiring some more people to get people back and properly empowered and, and have people there. So there was a point um, three years ago where if you were a farmer, you could expect to be inspected by the Environment Agency once every 267 years. Ah, I thought it was 1,000 years, but it's 267 267 years. years. Now now they've hired a couple more inspectors, so I think it's now every 60 years. Oh, yeah, so it's going to be pretty regular. (laughs) Um, So it's a problem solved. Um, Neil, I'm going to push you a little bit further, because as I understand it, um, I think you feel that um, we have to change the way we do business with livestock. I mean, you're not only saying we have to have a regulatory system, that's containing and, and, as it were, confronting the problem, but it's not solving it. Say a little bit more about what you mean in your very diplomatically couched way about changing livestock farming. Do we need to, do we need to, I'm going to come on to what people can do, but do we need to stop drinking milk? I don't think we need to stop drinking milk, uh, but we have got a structural and systemic problem with uh, intensive livestock production in, in, in the UK. And that, that is sort of underlying the water pollution problem, but also the cli- you know, a large part of our greenhouse gas emissions. About a quarter of our greenhouse gas emissions in the UK are coming from our food system. Uh, so yeah, uh, I, I think that climate change does create the opportunities to rethink uh, the way that the, the industry has been organized. We've got this relentless concentration of production um, and, you know, I, I don't think it works well for the cows. It doesn't work well for the farmers. It's a, it's a real struggle uh, to have a decent living and produce a margin, um, you know, to, to, to keep on the land. So we're seeing lots of dairy farmers going out of business, but con- uh, the production being concentrated in these ever larger herds. Yes. And, and that's just putting huge stress on <clears throat> the environment. It's as if we take the um, inexorable economic change as a given and then and just deal good. with the environmental consequences. Yes. Whereas it'd be better to take the environmental constraints as a given and think about how do we organise our food production to, to not mess up our rivers in that, in that system. And it's about much more mixed farming systems. Yes. We've got, just as an advert for EA Sustain, we've, tomorrow we've got two fantastic events. One with Ian Tolhurst, Tolly, who's talking about how he has managed to grow increasing amounts of food without any animal inputs in his soil and has allowed, has, has achieved increased fertility, increased organic matter, increased nutrients and, and out, n- very few inputs while sustaining a fantastic output. So we've got that, but we've also got kind of uh, the future of food, which is important, looking at different ways of doing agriculture. But we should come really back to this wonderful audience that sat with us uh, for the last 40 minutes. Is there anything, I mean, I mean we, we've agreed that we can, as it were, fix this problem. It is, perhaps the wrong metaphor, soluble. Um, but um, can the audience, can we as individuals do things that could increase the quality of our waters, that could be friendly towards our fish? How do we love our inner, um, yeah, marine freshwater well, can I make phytoplankton? Can I get one? I, I'd say, get onto Amazon, order for 12 quid something called ha- HANA, H A N A, testing kit, and go to your local river and start doing phosphate samples. And then post the results on Twitter, tag River Action, and we'll be, we'll be, we'll be on it. Um, so so this, this is a point, a serious point, in that 
with, with our environmental protection agencies having effectively shut down things like proper water quality monitoring. I mean, one of the, the, one, one of the biggest, most exciting things that's happened in this area is, is, is this national movement of citizen scientists. I mean, so take the River Wye, which is a hugely polluted river. In, you mean the River Wye, the riv not the real River Wye, which is in Derbyshire. No, I'm I talking about from. the real River Wye in the Welsh borders. Um, but but there, 900 people now are on a weekly basis getting into that river and taking nutrient samples, and that is the only reason we really know what has happened and how the intensive poultry industry in that part, part of the world has caused this unprecedented pollution and, and the algal blooms that have effectively killed the river um, is because of citizen scientists. And anyone can be a citizen scientist. Yes. And, and that data, given, given the way digital media and, and things can be shared and, mm -hmm. and so on, um, that is a, an immediate, an yes. immediate we, thing, yeah, yeah. tangible thing. I mean, yes. but being aware and voting in this yes. next election is going to be critical. Yes, I mean, it chimes with what Joanna said, was saying, that, that knowledge and information is a kind of empowerment and power. Neil, is there any, are you thinking of anything else? That well, I've, I've been quite struck by how the profile of this issue has increased mm. quite markedly over the last couple of years. I think we just need a TV documentary. We need to, Toby, Jones Toby Jones to lead... <laughs> To play Charles, actually. <laughs> that should do it. <laughs> On the River Wine, Derbyshire. That would work. In, in, in Herefordshire. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, that, anyway. That river is actually in better condition, you'll be pleased to hear, the Derbyshire Wine. It is in better condition. Yes, I don't... Although there is some bad sewage discharges in the lower re reaches. Yes. So, I mean, there is... Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. I might start to do this Hannah thing. I'm interested yeah. in the heron that feeds down in front I of I mean, the these river. estuaries here, I mean, along the, the coast, the Essex and Suffolk coast, I mean, we need information because, uh, you yeah. know, these are triple SIs. These are SAC, the estuarine environments, highly protected you know, protected by who? Yeah. Well, we're going to have to do it ourselves until we can get these, you know, law enforcement and environmental mm. protection properly re-established. We're going to have to do it ourselves. Yeah. I thought one thing that we should do at EA Sustain is we should have Neil's fantastic short paper, which is mm. you know been a source of the information for me. People should be able to download that and read it. Your fantastic eight-page account of of water. So okay. So 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 those are the things that. Uh, people can do, and now it's an opportunity which will possibly include dairy farmers, etc., to, to enter the conversation. Charles Clover's got his hand up, uh, and another gentleman here with a white badge on. Mm. We'll take those two to start with, one at the front as well. Mm. Okay, um, you mentioned about um, self-monitoring, but the water companies have just said that they're going to uh, put automatic monitoring in at all. So. With your lack of praising that, that somehow this is just another piece of greenwashing. Um, no, so what the water companies have to do now... Um, Did everybody get the question, sorry. first of all? No. OK, the question was, um, the water companies are telling us they're going to start doing more monitoring. Is this simply a greenwash of the issues which they failed to address so far? And Charles no, is so, so the specific there is what the water companies are now having to do is to do live disclosure and monitoring of when they are discharging sewage. Um, so so um, previously, the only, the only time, the majority of the times we knew that sewage was being discharged was because people were saying, look, there's sewage coming out of that, that storm overflow into a river or onto a beach. And so, so what they all have to do, I and mean, they have to have it up and up within, within a, a few weeks now, I think the deadline is, is they have to publish live monitoring so you can go onto the, each, each water company's um, website and you'll see where they are discharging sewage at a given time and over, over a time period. Yeah. They, of course they know that. Um, um, and they have been dishonest. I mean, for example, Southern Water was one of the few in proper um, in uh, enforcement actions. They were fined £90 million because they deliberately lied and concealed over a 15-year period all their sewage discharges. But they're not, they're not monitoring, obliged to publish that information on nutrients, on, on what's actually the quality of the water. They just have to say that we're actually discharging shit into the river today. Ch <laughs> yeah. Charles? had a question, I think. Uh, yes. Um, my question is, where did we go wrong? I, I knew uh, Nicholas Ridley uh, very well um, when he designed the privatization of water in 1989. Nicholas Ridley was a sea trout fisherman. He <laughs> cared deeply about rivers. And uh, while people of uh, different political complexion might think that he just wanted people to make money. He didn't. He was conscious that the previous regime, um, which many people aren't 
old enough to remember, was absolutely catastrophic because it relied upon the treasury coming up with the money to invest in rivers. So it never did. So we had the air and colder. If you fell in the air or colder, you would be lucky to survive. You had to have your stomach bumped out. The same was true of the Thames in the early 50s. Uh, there were rivers that were, you know, biologically dead. And then something better happened. But then it all went wrong. We had this chap... So uh, your question is that... My question when, is, where did we all go wrong? Where did we I mean, go I'm wrong? I'm going to finish yeah. with the, the, the question by asking, how do we get a proper analysis of where we all went wrong? Because something... There's been a regulatory failure. You answered that. There's been that. an investment failure. And uh, there has been a political failure. Okay, yeah. Neil, do you want to... Where did we go wrong? I think we've touched upon it, but do you want to expand a little bit? So I think the naivety around privatisation was that the, the law would be abided by, so if we have a strict regulatory regime, that fixes it. You're right. Prior to privatisation, uh, investment in sewage treatment had to compete against schools and hospitals, and, you know, it's not a, it's not a great vote winner, so it never really won, won out. So during the 70s, there was a lack of public spending on investing in... Uh, our infrastructure. Uh, but I think the, the hope at the time of uh, privatisation was that you would have uh, an economic regulator, an environment regulator, so compliance was assured and the regulation would sort all of that. And, it, and it's been the case, it's, be, it's been shown that that's just not been so. And it's just as elastic now. We go through austerity and we, we, um, we, we sack all the pollution inspectors, and, and, and effectively there's hardly any pollution regulation with teeth. Could, there are three uh, ladies here who have questions. We'll take those. We'll perhaps take two questions and, and yeah. Uh, I'll be quick. Mine's a suggestion. Um, and we, I think we should be more like the French farmers um, and become citizen activists and go and deliver our own personal sewage straight to our Tory MPs' offices. <laughs> <laughs> um, a little suggestion for everyone to be doing. Yes, it's a very nice <laughs> idea. There's a lady here with a green scarf in the middle. Yep. Uh, uh, well, we'll take those two questions, yeah. I'm just wondering if there's any um, leg room in uh, using what they call night soil, which is human excrement on our fields, if that's a reality, and what would be needed to make this happen? Yeah, night soil, and could we use that and, and make it happen in farming? And then the lady with the green scarf. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm from Wales, uh, on the River Wye our local River Wye, uh, we've got um, a problem with poultry farm pollution uh, going into the Wye, as we all know. Um, the local MP, let's name her, Faye Jones, mm -hmm. uh, when asked about this, said her priority was jobs uh, and not the river. My longer term question is, how do we change public understanding to the fact that the environment as, is as important as jobs, given that? Times are so tough. Yes, yeah, so there are two questions here. Can we move to systems whereby we use our sewage, you know, on our fields to act as a kind of fertilizer? And the other question was, how do we strike this balance that we seem to feel uh, always exists between what's, what's economic? In other words, why is it always an either or with economics and the environment? So those are, Charles, perhaps take. Uh, the second question there: Why do we always, why do we always prioritise jobs and talk about these issues, and then forego the issues of monumental pollution in the? Well, well, I, well I think uh, Caroline Lucas answered that question brilliantly in the last session. When you know there are different types of growth, and so I mean, and, uh, one of the things we're campaigning about, and this is very specific to the why, um, we we have millions of tons of, of manure. That's a polite word of calling it, coming out of the intensive poultry farms. And it is thrown out the window, it is dumped on the land, and it leaches into the soils, and it goes into the river, and it has killed the river. Um, now, in this part of the country, we are importing hundreds of millions of pounds worth of synthetic fertilisers from German agrochemical industries, yeah. um, phosphorus and nitrate-based fer fertilisers. Those very same nutrients in the Y have been chucked out the window and put on the land to wash into the rivers. Go to yeah. Devon, the biggest dairy-producing county in this, this country, or Cumbria, or, or West Wales, big dairy areas. The same is happening with slurry. You know, these are highly valuable nutrients that are being thrown away, and, and the, the dividing line of that being a, a valuable nutrient and being a toxic waste, it's just a knife edge. 
And so, and the technologies exist. I mean, there are entrepreneurs, there's a whole sector of new emerging businesses that will take this stuff, that will pelletize it, dry it, pelletize it. The problem with night soil is we've got to remember what else is in it. I mean, very little has been done about this. So, so, for example, the University of Strathclyde on the River Dee in Scotland, a, a group of students doing their master study, did, did some testing uh, for other things. Um, contraceptive pills, um, a, a, antibiotics, you, you, the pathogens that are in you know, animal and human excrement, you cannot, unfortunately, just sort of put it and shovel it on, onto the field because you, you've got to process it, you've got to, you've got to treat it, so, so you, you remove the other pathogens. Um, but there are circular economy solutions staring us at the face that will create jobs, that will create economic opportunity and solve a problem. But the problem is a farmer is a small an SME. They're a small businessman. They're, 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 they, you know, the, the average dairy for herd is, you know, it's a, these are these are smallholder businesses. That, you know, someone has got to intervene and create the regulatory framework that makes sure this happens. Um, uh, Neil, did you want to add anything to the ideas of new ways of dealing? I, I mean, you know, basically you're saying there's money in shit. And we could be using our entrepreneurial skill. And there to... always has been. For yeah, centuries yeah. there has yeah, been. Yeah. Um, I've been uh, holed up in the Wye Valley this last week, just got back yesterday. I've never seen the Wye so high as uh, this, this time. Um, the, the concentration... High issue, in the sense the, of the, the, the river, water. There's water everywhere, yeah. Um, Not cocaine being flushed out. Of no. Um, well, that, that too. Uh, this concentration point, I mean, the, the number of poultry sheds in the Wye catchment more than, I think doubled in about a four or five year period. There were estimated 20 million poultry birds in that one catchment. So it, it's similar to the dairy thing. We've got this geographical concentration of intensive animal production in sensitive environments. Mm. Uh, Has someone so, allowed that to happen? Yeah. 26% yeah. of, the, of the intensively farmed birds in this country are in the Wye catchment which is about 2% of the surface area, and it happens to be a, a highly protected environmental area. I mean, who allowed that to happen? It's lovely to hear you asking those questions, Charles. No, I mean, it's great to see your passion about it. There's a question over here, gentleman in a grey jumper with glasses, called Adam. <laughs> Mark. Um, just a, a very quick one. The mention earlier on uh, monitoring our rivers and, and estuaries. Uh, I don't know if there's anyone here from Woodbridge, but Woodbridge have been doing a fantastic job uh, working with the University of Suffolk. Uh, the mayor of Woodbridge, Eamon, I don't know his surname, uh, they've, they've done uh, brilliant work. And I, I think other rivers are looking at that. So um, my question, and unless it was in uh, the first five minutes and, and I missed it, um, for uh, 15 years or so, Natural England and the Environment Agency have put a lot of money, a lot of people, into working on, on what was called catchment-sensitive farming. Um, I'd, I'd just be interested, has that played any useful part Thirty seconds. Addressing uh, the issues. Thirty seconds each, guys. So we've got to wrap um, up. Brilliantly well intended, not well implemented, which is why we have such polluted rivers. Brilliant. It's a lovely idea. Working in partnership, advice. You know, not not regulation, not the state telling people what to do. I think when it comes to water quality and pollution regulation, you need enforcement of law, strict enforcement of law. And that is not that model. We live in a regime with strict enforcement by that force of nature, Joe Anui, who's telling me that we have to wrap up. <laughs> so unfortunately, but there are many more questions. Neil will be signing his book, uh, Net Zero Food and Farming at the Bookstand. Charles will sign you up to join his charity, which is fighting for water quality and fighting it in the court, court case almost as we speak, or coming up in the next week. But that was a fantastic session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to your great questions. Thank you.